Hello. Thank you so much for joining us today as a group of deaf and disabled artists explore what it means to make work now, hosted by the Welcome Collection. For those who aren't familiar with the Welcome Collection, it's a free museum and library in London that explores health and being human, making connections across science, medicine, life and art. Though the building is currently closed, you can check out stories, books and live events online at welcomecollection.org. My name is Jamie Hale. Um, I'm seated in an electric wheelchair in front of a bookshelf. I have short ginger hair and a ginger beard and I'm wearing glasses. I'm not wearing glasses, apologies. I use they as my gendered pronoun. Um, so. I'm a disabled poet. Um, my first collection, Shield, was published this month, artist and curator, and I wrote a series of articles on art, activism and access for the welcome last year. All of the wonderful artists we've got with us today were featured in that series, and you can find a link to it in the event information. I'm going to hopefully pose some interesting questions that will spark up a set of discussions between all of the wonderful people you'll be meeting. So just to help ensure that everyone has a positive experience and that this is a safer space for people to share their questions, we do expect everyone to take responsibility for their conduct and behaviour. So that means that offensive language or behaviour which may cause harm will not be tolerated. And this includes language that is racist, disabled, sexist, homophobic, transphobic, abusive, religiously or culturally offensive. We will be actively monitoring Slido and will remove questions or comments which are offensive. However, we really encourage questions and comments which aren't offensive. So please do pose questions to us there. We're working, as is everyone at the moment, with the limitations of technology that we're all variably used to. So please excuse any choppiness or disfluency in the conversation. Um, I'm just going to give you a quick rundown of the artists we're lucky enough to have joining us today. So Emma Selwyn, who also works as Zandri Selwyn, is a performer and trainee co-director with Access All Areas, whose work includes My Hands and Feet Are Wiggling and Not Effing Sorry, pieces that challenge and welcome the audience in equal measure. Keith Salmon is a Scottish landscape artist with a visual impairment, whose work I encountered when he won the Jolo Mo Prize for Scottish Landscape Artist in 2009. I love his work. It's somehow both bold and finely detailed, realistic and impressionistic. I don't know how he does this, but it's well worth looking at. Um, Miss Jackie is a spoken word performance artist and singer songwriter. Um, her EP Perceptions is it's gorgeous. It's powerful and it's luscious. It moves really fluidly between spoken word and incredible vocals, especially in the song Freedom. Sign Kid is a hip hop artist and deaf music producer, writer and performer whose work integrates British sign language and sound to create a new fusion equally accessible to deaf and hearing audiences, as well as running Sign Slang UK, a project that collects and exhibits British sign language slang in an innovative and groundbreaking way and which you can check out online. So please do. Um, and Finally, Amelia Cavallo is a blind non-binary theatre practitioner and co-founder of Quiplash, which creates space for queer disabled people through performance, training, access consultancy and disability justice. Tito Bone, 
their drag alter ego moves from musical theatre to aerial circus with equal fluency. Um, and in this talk, there are going to be four kind of sections. Um, I'll speak to each of the artists briefly about their own artistic practice, and then we'll move into a wider discussion on how it relates to, art, to people as deaf or disabled artists, how the pandemic has affected us all as artists, and then take questions from the audience. So if anything comes into mind, please submit it via Slido. Um, and now to begin with our artists, I'm going to go around and ask you all to quickly describe yourself to the audience, share your pronouns if you want, and then spend about a minute telling us about your artistic practice. And we're starting with Emma, who is a video for this section. So Emma, thank you. Um, I go by Emma, uh, or Zandri is a name. I use they and she pronouns. And I'm wearing a blue V-neck t-shirt. I'm white. I have dark brown, uh, longish hair that's uh, tied back on the top and hazel eyes. I'm a live artist, director, and actor and training consultant, and I've created both solo and ensemble pieces. I think I mostly do live art and or cabaret and or autobiography, but I don't like to be just one thing. Thanks for having me on here. And then Keith. Do you want to tell us a bit about your practice? I'm Keith Sam. Hi, I'm, I'm Keith Salmon. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm a 61 year old um, uh, male, white. Um, I don't have much hair, so I tend to keep my head shaved. Um, and I have a short, stubbly grey beard. And that's, that's what I look like, I guess. Um, I'm a painter, a traditional painter. Um, and I'm also a landscape painter, though I don't really create paintings um, in the kind of normal landscape sense. Um, my works are all based on uh, the many, many walks that I've done in the, the hills and mountains and wild places of Scotland and the rest of the UK. And so my paintings, um, they're about trying to um, convey something of my experience of being in these wonderful wild places. Um, as my sight in the last few years has, has got even worse and, and, and is deteriorating quite rapidly now, um, I've had to adjust the way I work again and I'm starting to explore using sound with my paintings. And I take a sound recorder on my walks and I use this as my sketchbook. And then I, I listen to the sounds as I paint um, uh, to help me sort of recall the place that I was in. So that's about me, I guess. Thank you so much. Um, Jackie. Hey, uh, I'm Miss Jackie. Um, I am predominantly a spoken word artist um, and I singer songwriter. I love everything creative. Um, I will find creativity in some way, shape or form. Um, I am a black woman with long black hair in twists swooped to the side, you know, try to be elegant. Um, and I'm wearing a bright red uh, T-shirt and my background is blurred. Um, yeah. That's a little bit about me and my work. <laughs> Thank you so much. Sign Kid. Hello, everyone. My name is Sign Kid. And that's how it's signed, my sign name. I'm a man, black man. I have black hair. I have on a white top. I'm a producer songwriter and I perform signed songs on a stage to audiences. I previously worked with Mr. Off Key, who's hearing himself. However, he was, he was a, a lyricist, he was rapping for me. He would translate my signed music to aud so that I could show this uh, when I was performing. 
I recently established a company called Viewable, and this is um, a collection of digital signed vocabulary, which is which is which is um, online for audience for the audiences to see. And that's me. Thank you so much, Sarah and Kid and Amelia. Hi there, my name is Amelia Cavallo. Uh, my pronouns are they, them, and I'm a slim white human with fuzzy brown hair. It's quite short. I usually shave it, um, but it needs it needs another shave, so it's a bit messy. Um, I have quite prominent facial features, including a rather prominent nose um, with a septum ring in it. Today I'm wearing some small mushroom earrings and I've got a blue pinstriped blazer on with some pins in it and an orange top underneath. And my background, um, I think you can mainly just see the white wall behind me and maybe a bit of the couch that I'm on. Um, and in terms of what I do, I, uh, as an independent artist, I'm a multidisciplinary theater practitioner. So that means I do a bit of performing, so I work as a musician and an actor and an aerialist and, as Jamie pointed out, a drag performer, among other things. I also uh, do training and access consultancy and um, that kind of stuff as well, and have recently started to do a bit of directing and producing. And the directing and producing in particular feeds, and the access consultancy feeds into the company that I co-run with my partner in life, crime and business. Um, that partner, that partner is called Al Lander. <laughs> that business is called Quiplash. Quip, Quip is a love, as a is an amalgamation of the words queer and crip, so it denotes queer disabled people. And as Jamie already said, we work to take space for deaf and disabled queer people, and we do that through making performance work and also through training um, folks who want to be more inclusive. Um, to queer and and or deaf and disabled people. And thank you, that's me. <laughs> thank you so much. It's really lovely to hear about all of the things people do. You seem to do an awful lot of things, Amelia. Um, it, I, I, I don't know where you find the time, I really don't. Um, <laughs> so if we kind of think about how our artistic practice relates to us as deaf and or disabled artists, does anyone have any initial thoughts about that interaction of experience? How has being deaf and or disabled changed or shaped your artistic practice? How do the two interrelate? Amelia, go for it. Well, I think I can actually use this question to kind of talk to why I do so many things. Um, I think that, I mean, I've always been blind. I've always been queer. Um, I kind of knew more about that as I got older, but um, I, I, there's no way I could have shaped an artistic practice without those things being integral to it. Um, and I think that being uh, a particularly a disabled artist means that a lot of times you don't get given spaces um, in the same way that non-disabled and neurotypical people get. So you have to do everything. So the reason I do a lot of stuff is partially because I'm interested in it, but also partially because if I didn't kind of build the house and then also make, you know, the interior design of the house and then decide, you know, like I, if I didn't do everything, I probably wouldn't have gotten to do anything. Um, or at least that's how it's felt for me. Um, and I guess the other side of it is that uh, access both for myself um, and for the other people I work with and for the audiences that anything that I'm performing in or that Quiplash is running, um, that we're presenting to people, we um, we make sure that access as a uh, to, as an equalizing tool, but also as a creative tool, is present in everything that we do and that I do. And um, I don't know that I would have been someone that would have done that if I didn't need it. So yeah, it's a pretty massive part of my artistic practice. I definitely understand that. Um, Jackie, I know that you. Yeah, um, I think for me, it's pretty similar to what Amelia said about like, um, I'm a wheelchair user. I've 
I have a wheelchair. Um, so I don't think I could create art without that without it being a part of me because I was like everyone always thinks it's like some really heroic story of why I'm in a wheelchair it's not I was born like that this is just genetics um and I think especially creating art I I had to create my own lane because I got sick and tired of having to explain why I, me wanting to do this creative thing was just as important as everyone else wanting to do this creative thing so I was like well if they don't want to listen I'm gonna just have to show you and then that's when people are like oh oh okay it is possible and then you kind of force them to be like well it's in your face now so you choosing to ignore that people have access needs or you can integrate them into shows your it's your problem it's your problem now and it's not mine <laughs> there's a sort of position that you're put in where you're forced to do everything yourself and if you want work that reflects you and your experience you're forced to create it which is such a challenging force but can also be such a creative force and I think one of the things that a lot of people here share is that their work has done a lot to create spaces for other deaf and disabled creatives rather than just for themselves um, whether that's through kind of trailblazing through the mainstream art world as Keith has done or whether that's through setting up something like Quiplash or Sign Slang um, and it's I think it's something that deaf and disabled artists bring that's really valuable. Um, Keith? Um, I of course um, I, my site was fine for the first 30 years of my life and, and I, I went to art college back in the, the late 70s, early 80s, and I carried on working as an artist. Um, and so uh, for me, um, my sight loss came about quite suddenly. Um, and it was a case of, of uh, really, you know, sort of do I, I, I just sort of stop making visual art or, or do I find a way of, of continuing to do it? And, and that was really the only option for me. Um, and so... Uh, the, the visual impairment, um, it, it, since 1990, when the site went bad, it has obviously had a, a sort of direct um, sort of impact on how my work looks. Um, I obviously see very differently from, from how I used to see, and that has affected sort of how I now create my paintings. But I think one of the biggest impacts um, the visual impairments had has been the fact that um, as an artist, as a painter particularly, um, who has to live by selling my work, um, I found the visual impairment side has, has impacted me most in my ability or lack of ability uh, to actually promote my work efficiently. Um, I'm not very good technically, as you found in the run up to this um, event. Um, so I find um, uh, promoting my work uh, to raise uh, awareness of what I do and therefore make sales which pay my wages, I find that has been impacted perhaps more than the actual creative side. I've been able to find ways around uh, the visual impairment problems to a large extent to carry on doing the creative side. But the actual practical side of, of running my practice as a business, as an artistic business, that has been impacted quite quite a great deal. It's a way in which the barriers set up by the world that's, that don't need to be there end up impacting on one's ability to have kind of what mainstream perceives as success as an artist and it's barriers that, that don't need to be there. There is no reason why society should make it harder for you to promote your art than anyone else and yet it does and I, I think that again that's something that everyone here kind of experiences this sense of social barriers impacting on our ability to have success on our own terms. Yeah I, I, I think you're, you're, you're right um, It'd be interesting to, to or interesting to hear um, how the others of, of, of find the, the sort of uh, the, the, the practical sides of, of, of running their, 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 their artistic careers. Um, uh, it, so I've, I found that part very, very difficult. Indeed. Um, Amelia. 
Um, I was just going to, I mean, I, I don't know the visual art world, but Keith, I was just going to say that I completely, as another blind person as well, um, I feel you on the logistics of it, that it's so hard and trying to navigate websites and social media platforms, especially now, which I know is getting a little bit into the next section, but that, you know, now that everything is digital, it makes it so much harder when being in a digital space um, is your access barrier. So, um, and I know, like, I can imagine that the visual art world has its own very specific nuanced ways of making that difficult. So, um, yeah, I can, I can, under I just, I just wanted to say that I second this um, from a performance background. It's still really hard. Um, and I was also going to say, I think that um, in relation to, I would, I wonder if this is the case for a lot of folks, but one thing I definitely find when I kind of go outside of the bubbles that I create is a question about why the non-disabled masses might want me there. And the kind of, there's always that underlying question of like, am I here as a tick box exercise or do you actually like what I'm doing? And I don't think it's an either or answer. It's probably a little bit of both being real, especially um, for those that are filling out those like arts council um, applications and stuff, um, you know, no, no, no disrespect to the Arts Council, but um, yeah, I think um, that's another thing. I, I don't, I wonder if other folks have that experience and I, I would imagine that um, that question of why am I here, is it because I tick a box for you? Um, I wonder if that's something that a lot of marginalized people generally feel. I, I, I think so, Amelia. Um, I very much had to come to the conclusion that feel free to invite me here to tick your box. I'm happy to be here to tick your box because you think I'm ticking your box, but you're giving me a platform and you're giving me a new audience and you're giving me space to show that actually I do what I do really well. And who knows, maybe I don't, but that level of like, if you're going to give me the space then I'm going to take it and claim it and make it my own is so important, I think to kind of making success as deaf and or disabled artists. Does anyone else have any thoughts on these sort of questions of how your practice relates to you as a deaf and or disabled artist more broadly? Jackie, yes. Um, I also wanted to add, like, there's this thing of the work that I create. So I work with words and music and sound. I don't create work because I'm disabled. I create work because I'm an artist. And if people I, like see themselves in that art, I'm super duper happy. But I get really, like, um, weird when people are like oh my god you're so inspiring you've never seen me do anything but live like that isn't I'm, I'm sorry are we not all just doing that um so I think for me I create art because I genuinely am an artist and I just so happen to have a disability but that you could say that about anybody's life experiences and being an artist and how does that uh impede like impact on their work um so yeah sometimes I'm just like I just want to make work like you know leave me alone <laughs> um but yeah I think that's what it that that's what it is for me the one that always gets me is when people say oh you're so inspiring and I say well you know what did you see did you did you like it and they're like oh I, I haven't seen your work but I know that you do it and that's really inspiring and it's like please buy a ticket next time um Emma I know that you had your hand up Um, if the question that's being addressed right now is about um, how 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 your practice relates to deaf and or disabled audiences, I think that was the question that's being asked. Um, and I could relate to a lot of Jackie's points that were made just now. Um, because because the fact that someone is disabled and an artist doesn't mean they're doing it just to say, look at me, 
I'm disabled, I'm here to inspire you. I think we can all soundly say that inspiration porn is, um, uh, I'm going to try not to swear here, cow feces. Um, And for all of us, well, I say for all of us, I don't know how true this is because the level that our disabilities as artists or possibly even otherwise can impact what we do varies between person to person and even from day to day or possibly moment to moment within the same person. Um, And I've actually found since the current situation, as I call it, um, that it's shocking for me that how many of my colleagues and how many people I work with just cannot access this digital spaces. And this is due to potential lack of support in the environments that they're supported in because my company has um, many learning disabled people um, in it and many of them are from um, possibly derived backgrounds and even if not then um, I don't know whether I was trying to make a point but I could not make my hands and feet are wiggling without actually owning disability. Did Sign Kid have their hand up? I'm not sure. Did I miss Sign Kid wanting to come in? Um, should we have audio right now? Because I can't currently hear. Um, Izzy Kapu is just explaining the question to Sign Kid. Oh, okay. To respond. So just saying, just explaining Emma's point and asking if he wanted to respond. Sure. Okay. Thank you so much making work that is kind of accessible is always a work in progress we're all learning at the moment um Deepaku, you need your microphone on really it's been quite difficult to access information at this time that's been the biggest impact especially when um, watching the news or the Prime Minister brief, it's been a huge impact for me as I'm not aware of what's happening and therefore the information is lost. The subtitles are a problem, there's a delay with regards to how I'm able to access that information. I usually have to ask several people, go out of my way, go out of home to find out what the rules are now. Can I go out, can I not? And I'm having to take all that information and put a puzzle together so I know what is going on. As they're not providing interpreters when the PM is giving a briefing. And therefore, I'm not aware of what the information is. I think it's really important that they follow the Equality Act. Um, I think there's been an excuse that they state, oh, we haven't had time to book an interpreter. However, that's no excuse. It's not a good enough excuse. I think there's often an excuse made with access that, oh, we didn't know how, or, oh, we didn't have time, or, oh, we Googled, but we couldn't find the answer, so we just did it anyway, which ends up really not just isolating and marginalising us in our careers, but when it's things like essential lockdown rules and health information, could could end up being life-threatening for people who just aren't getting access to information 
and it's the presumption that the digital world is better for disabled people. I know that I've read countless articles by disabled people being like, it's brilliant, everything is accessible now. And they say that about events that don't have interpreters, that don't have audio description, that don't have captions, that are on platforms that don't work with eye gaze or switch access. And you just think, no, no, it's it's more accessible for some people and not others. Um, I just wanted to come back quickly on something that Emma said um, about inspiration porn um, and how, and to clarify for people that haven't encountered that phrase, um, it's a way of framing disabled people even doing very normal things and living our lives as somehow being incredibly inspirational. You know, you get it for like going to the supermarket and it's like, no, no, I'm just doing my weekly shop. And then the idea that other disabled people are kind of held up against those standards, you know, are we doing the things that are inspirational? If not, why not? It kind of feeds into this narrative of either you're superhuman or you're subhuman. You can't just be human. Um, and I think so Keith had his hand up a little bit earlier so I'm just going to drop back to Keith. Oh right yeah one of the things that um, a couple of people have said and, and uh, kind of agree with you know sort of wholeheartedly is is the statement that sort of uh, I'm an artist uh, first and, and primarily I've been doing this for 40 years uh, and I just happen to be visually impaired and um, and unfortunately when I um, uh, have exhibitions and this has happened quite regularly over the, the last 20 or 30 years um, is that um, when the, the, the press get to hear about the exhibition um, they're, they're, they're not absolutely sort of uh, you know sort of there because of the work um, but because of the story that goes with the idea that, um, as they describe me, um, I'm a blind artist rather than an artist who happens to have a visual impairment. Um, and th this this kind of um, uh, the way that I'm, I'm kind of described um, then has um, a sort of an impact on how my my work is perceived, unfortunately, not by everyone. Um, but by, by quite a few people. And of course, as a painter, um, you know, I my paintings, it doesn't matter when it comes down to it, whether I can see a lot or not very much or nothing. If I'm producing paintings, the paintings are paintings. And when they go on the wall in an exhibition, they go there alongside every other painting that everyone else has done. Um, and so that description of me being a blind painter, um, it, it means nothing about my paintings. You know, the, the paintings, when they're done, um, are, are either, you know, sort of hopefully good, but they may be bad. Um, but that's that's all it is. The, the, the blindness at that point, um, the visual impairment, um, has nothing to do with the work. And yet it's so often seen in a different way because of the title that comes with it. I was talking to another poet about this and he described things in terms of work issuing from an experience but not being read it's in terms of that experience solely and I thought that was a really interesting perspective that my creative work issues from my experience as a disabled person but doesn't need to be read solely in terms of that experience. Um, now, I know that SignKid had his hand up a moment ago, so if we go back to SignKid. Thank you. So also I'd like to add to what I previously expressed. Uh, there is some difficulty within the uh, deaf co community uh, with regards to the, the BSL The BSL Act. Sometime in March 2003, there was a BSL March, and eventually BSL was recognized as an official language. However, there's been not much change. We're still experiencing the same difficulties within the community, um, and it's 
and at ment the mental health of some deaf people has deteriorated as a result. There's also been difficulty with education, um, DSA, when attending universities, there's been delays and cuts of uh, funding for deaf, dis, uh, deaf people who also have additional disabilities. So attending university has become quite challenging for many. So it feels as if not so, it, they haven't done what is sufficient to support deaf people, despite the protests. Um, I'm not sure they've done enough, and I don't know whether So they haven't, they haven't done enough. However, when you look at Scotland, Scotland have recognised and have recognised the language and they've done so much more. However, here in England, they haven't done sufficient work to support deaf people within the community. I mean, yeah, that is incredibly true and also very frustrating. Um, and I think, I mean, I've noticed this with Disabled Students Allowance, where the the live captioners just don't turn up to my lecture and then I don't know what's being said. I've been trying to get a computer since June. It's the sense that there's always something else as a priority and access can wait that we kind of face in our lives and also in our art. Um, Emma, I know you had your hand up a few moments ago. Um... Yes, um, it disabled students and um, are definitely struggling. Um, but I've also found that um, there's equally a lot of vulnerability among um, the learning disabled and sometimes I find that um, professional learning disabled artists work is uh, and or education is perhaps to some extent left on the sidelines unless they're intellectual enough and um, Sign Kid talked about how um, his struggles with getting information meant he had to ask lots of people. Um, and uh, it, um, and, um, uh, it's it's not only life threatening in the sense of the current situation, but it's also very challenging and frustrating as a professional because um, whatever your neurotype um, and whatever disabilities you've had, um, even today you still get people say you still get people in professional actors groups saying, "I know you can do this. I know you can do this." put your mind to it and I'm just like and it's and seeing that it's just like you have no idea how much I I want to swear but I don't think I can because this is YouTube how much we've got to put up just to even begin to get the tip of our elbow touching the dinner table along with everyone else. Amelia. Thank you for that, Emma. Um, I know that Amelia wanted to come in, um, but I also know that we want to talk about how the pandemic has affected us as deaf and or disabled artists. So moving the conversation in that direction, do you still want to come in, Amelia? Um, yeah, that's okay. I was kind of going to go there. Um, cause I felt like that's where we were veering anyway. Um, I was, I, I don't, I think in my head anyway, this is kind of merging what a lot of folks have said, um, in relation to what's going on now. And I think there are these really, uh, if I'm being kind, I'll say interesting. If I'm being less kind, I'll say really annoying and frustrating, 
um, tensions that are happening for a lot of deaf, disabled, and neurodiverse folks around things that say, particularly like chronically ill folks have been asking for for years and suddenly the world is on fire and all the things that they've asked for um, that they didn't get beforehand are now available, like being able to work remotely, um, being able to take breaks and have time off, um, that kind of stuff, which I know is not universal, but that's been more of a prevalent conversation at least. Um, and then that tension kind of, as soon as the, the lockdown restrictions, at least in the experience that I've had in this country, as soon as the lockdown restrictions kind of um, release this rhetoric around, oh, we should do more digital stuff because it's quote unquote accessible for everyone. Um, for the folks that that is accessible to, the second the lockdown restrictions release um, a little bit, then you just go back to you know business as it was, um, anything that was, you know, accessible a week ago for folks that can't get into inaccessible buildings, suddenly, well, now we're back in the inaccessible bu buildings, sorry about it, and we never had audio description, BSL, relaxed performances anyway, so why should we start now? Um, and so to be an audience member in that, to be somebody that wants to take part in communities that are making work, that's really hard. To um, be somebody who wants to make stuff in those communities, that's really hard. Um, because I mean, I, my experience is that I often find that I feel like I'm the lone voice kind of going, Hey, Hey, audio description. Remember that? Remember that thing that you were interested in for five seconds, two months ago? Um, you know, remember that, I don't know, deaf people exist and maybe you should give them some access and, um, not assume that you can do it in two days. Um, you know, all that kind of stuff. It's very, th this time, my experience of this time is it's very interesting to see, uh, how kind of individuals, but also communities of people uh, react to trauma and react to stress and what they claim they're going to do versus what they do. And yeah, so there's that kind of like individual experience of things that the, the goalposts for what is and isn't accessible keep moving. And it is impossible as an artist, make as an art maker and as a person who wants to take in art to keep track of that let alone take care of yourself in the midst of that. And um, there's also a split of like, you know, institutions that have, in my opinion, which I will not name, really failed um, in this um, regime where they had a, they have funds, they have time, they have more time than they usually do to rethink their processes and they're not. Um, and then there's also been wonderful changes in other organizations and I will absolutely give a big up to welcome here uh, for really taking the time to go, we, we, we have, We've had to pause, so we're going to do, we're going to investigate our own stuff and do better um, when they weren't even doing, you know, like when they were doing good beforehand. So like, um, yeah, this time the goalposts keep moving and uh, clocking who is willing to uh, work on a new normal that is more inclusive and who is not is, is it's very clear to me. Um, and I probably should leave it there before I say something super shady. <laughs> I think I, I agree with you there. And I think one of the difficulties that one often faces is that if I want an institution to include me as a queer artist, then it's about, you know, this is the name I use. These are the pronouns I use. These are the things to be aware of. If I want them in, to include me as a disabled artist, it's hi, Barbican Centre. Do you fancy putting in a hoist adapted changing room right near the stage for me? And I mean, the Barbican Centre said yes and then did so. So huge credit to them. But it's asking institutions to spend money to change their practice. And that's when you kind of see whether they really care about it or whether they're paying lip service. Um, Jackie, did you want to come in and then we will go on to audience questions? Yeah, um, so I'm going to there's like two sides of how the pandemic has affected me as an artist. And like the first side is like really positive. And I say that because for so many years, because of my access, like not being able to get into buildings and just have like conversations with organizations and companies that I've always wanted to work with now that it's on a digital I'm like you can't ignore me now like what's your excuse like we can jump on a zoom real quick do you know what I mean whereas like on the other side of it I've seen how much of an issue is out there for the deaf and disabled and neurodivergent community in terms of access and I think what has happened is so many people have been forced to work in silos for so long that now that we've come even like tighter as a community we can say oh 
that happens over there oh no it's been happening over here too how can we like bridge that gap and i think that's been really amazing but i also wanted like for me what has happened has been like at the beginning of the pandemic it was purely i'm just trying to survive like that is it nobody else to do nothing i'm just trying to survive something that has never happened in my lifetime then it started to become with the a resurgence of the black lives matter movement and now i'm into like i'm intersectional what does that mean and i think it's forced me personally to go whatever space i'm in i'm going to talk about whatever issues matter to me in that moment whereas before i felt like i had to pick a side if i'm in a certain uh place that i would only be able to talk about uh black people and issues that happen to us or if i was in a disabled space i can only talk about access needs and things like that when in actuality i am one person so all of those things affect me in different ways and i think it's important to recognize those things so creating an accessible space but also creating a space that doesn't make people feel like they have to choose a community to be a part of um yeah <laughs> Yeah, thank you so much for that. Um, and that kind of moved, that kind of answered one of the questions that we had, um, which was um, just finding it here. Um, it was asking about how connected it was. It was aimed at you, um, and was asking about how connected you feel to other Black British disabled creatives, um, and especially Black British disabled creative women, um, and how um, Black disabled women in the arts could be better supported. So I just thought I'd see if you wanted to extend your thoughts in the context of that question. Yeah, um, that's a that's a really good question. One, um, I think for me, I was doing a lot of work um, around uh, intersectionality and deaf and disabled neurodivergent artists who are also black, uh, Asian, uh, ethnically diverse. Um, so I was doing that for a very long time and I realised that it's a bigger issue in terms of the disability arts community than I realized and it was a lot and I was having a lot of conversations and trying to connect with as many people as possible and I had to kind of slow down that work because it was a lot of like late nights and early mornings on top of being an artist and trying to pay my rent um so I personally want to continue that work um soon don't worry I'm applying for funding so I will get I, I will make sure it happens but in terms of connecting slide into my dms like easy breezy if you have a question or you want to connect or you want to collaborate um I am very open to all of that good stuff please appropriately slide into my dms okay great <laughs> and I have a pretty solid track record with arts council applications so if you're doing funding apps and want to hand like You've got me. Um, another interesting question um, is whether people think it's more important to make art for the deaf and disabled community or to make art for the general public that may or may not connect to being deaf and or disabled. Um, Emma, do you want to come in on that? How now, Brown Cow? We've got you. Cool. Um, what was the question again? Sorry. Um, it was about um, making art specifically for the deaf and disabled community and or making art for the general public. Right. OK. Um, yes, it's imperative that we make work for. Well, I feel it's imperative that we make work for the deaf and disabled um, because they have a right to enter entertain and be entertained as much as everyone else this is why i'm involved with croydon gig buddies right now um and have been for a few months but um a massive massive part of my work is that it's it's not going to necessarily be a hundred percent accessible for every single person on the planet i realize this and i know i need to do better and i'm figuring out how to do that but at the end of the day, if we don't get the holistics and the neurotypicals and the cishets and the whatever majorities on side, um, then we're fucked. Excuse my language, but that's how strongly I feel. Um, and 
that's why I make the work I want to do. I want to be like, I've forgotten its name, but there was a show about, I think it was a barbershop that a black British comedian did in the 80s or something. And that had a massive white audience. Like, I want, I want my work to be open and available and not threatening to all, but certainly inviting and challenging to all. I think that's all I'm going to say for the time being. Go on, Amelia. I think, hang on a sec. Um, I think that idea of being both inviting and challenging is really important. Like, come into the art, but be prepared to be challenged by it. And I'm actually going to go to Keith next. Sorry, Amelia. Thank you, Jamie. Um, no, I, I was, I've, I've kind of, um, uh, you know, I sort of been thinking about about this with my own work, um, work being very visual, um, and and sort of how um, sort of as my own sight has has got worse, how I've become more aware of of kind of issues of other sight impaired people sort of approaching two dimensional visual art. Um, and I, a couple of years ago, I got involved in a project um, uh, which was using um, technology to cr- try and create a, um, uh, an audio descriptive kind of tool that, that sort of recognised where a person was in front of a painting. Uh, and then, um, depending on where you were, your proximity to the painting, it then gave you a whole series of different audio information from a set of speakers around. Um, and it worked quite well, but it was it was very much technology reliant and, and technology which wasn't that reliable at the time. Um, but one of the things I found, as I said in my introduction, I, I'm starting as my site's got even worse. I've started to to try and use sound, and this was not because I was thinking about creating work that would help other visually impaired people. It was a very selfish kind of approach. It was how can I, as a visually impaired visual artist, sort of try and get around some of the problems of not seeing very much? And and sound seemed to be the answer. And so the work that I do now, as I say, I I collect sound, I use it to help me create the paintings. But then I work with professional sound engineers to create high quality, um, short um, soundtracks, which then are part of the actual work the landscape work as a whole. So as you you stand in front of a painting, you hear a soundtrack. And so one of the things I've found is that the solution for me to help create create my work has also created something that will help other visually impaired people and even people who are totally blind who go to a gallery with one of these pieces of work in actually get an inclusive uh, landscape experience so if you only have a little bit of sight then the the soundtrack helps you interpret the, the 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 thing that you see on the wall in front of you and if you have no sight at all the the soundtrack is of such a good quality that that is the piece of landscape art um and so as I, say, I haven't gone out my way to create um work that is specifically for other um uh, sight impaired people but through the process that I've gone through with my own sight loss, it's it's turning to to for me to create work which is actually more accessible for people with sight loss. If that makes sense, it makes. Sense. Um, it's really nice to look at the ways in which like access and creativity get embedded within one another and like build on each other to improve the work. Um, I'm going to go to Amelia next, and then after Amelia, Sign Kid, if you want to come in on this, then I will give you a, a slot. So go for it, Amelia. Um, yeah, lovely. Thank you. I'm just going to, to a certain degree, re, uh, build on what others have said, and then also just kind of give the take that I have and that also Quiplash has on this. So as a disabled maker who knows other disabled makers, my favorite thing is when disabled people make pieces that are not about their disability. And the disability is always there um, because it's them. Uh, but it's, or or if there's a piece about them being disabled and it's infused with joy. I think that disabled people, also a lot of queer people, also a lot of people of color um, are expected to sell their trauma to people. And I'm not really interested in that unless of course people want to make a piece about it. 
But I think there are some ethics around what is expected of people who've been through hard times and oppression, um, what, what is expected of them to put on a stage um, or on a painting or in a film or whatever. So for me, and I've been able to explore this with my drag self, um, Tito does a lot of talking about being a blind non-binary bisexual drag king, but it's all with joy and humor. Um, so some of the things that I do as Tito come from pain, come from a lot of difficult things I've been through, but I make sure I want it to be a joyful experience for myself. And if it's joyful for everybody else, whether whether or not they're deaf or disabled um, is or not, is kind of not, not really, like, that's great if it is, but that's not necessarily my goal. Um, but in terms of, I think, um, the wider stuff, like when Quiplash is curating a space, we are very careful about that, what that means. So everyone is welcome. But that space is specifically first and foremost for deaf, disabled, neurodiverse, queer people, which seems like a niche, but there's a lot of us out there, um, as might be kind of apparent just by this panel alone. Um, and so we make sure, I think, as Emma said, I think it's really true that you reach towards 100% accessible, but um, there's absolutely no such thing as absolutes. Like you, you reach for it, you may never get there, um, but you're you're working towards a thing and that's great. And the thing for us is that when we have uh, non-disabled, neurotypical, cisgendered, straight you know, people in the space, um, we make it very clear that they're a guest in our house. And so you can be there and I hope you enjoy yourself, but um, if you are not used to people talking, fidgeting, uh, wiggling around during a performance, if you're not used to a sign language um, interpreter being on stage, if you're not used to audio description, deal with your own discomfort. Sorry about it. Um, this space isn't for you and every other space is. So I think that might you know, seem like kind of a, a hard line, but my personal experience is that the more wishy-washy I get about that when creating something, the less successful it is. Um, so that's kind of, in terms of making things for non-disabled audiences, um, you are invited to come if you want. Thank you so much for that, Amelia. Um, I think that was a pretty good manifesto of a lot, what a lot of us work on here. Um, Simon Kidd, did you want to come in on any of this? My personal experience up, up to now has been really that people thoughts with regards to deaf people are quite different. They see it as a problem. And I think that it's that they need further education and awareness about deafness, about disability. Deaf people are very skilled. They have hot skills. They have they're very um, intelligent. When we meet hearing people, however, and we say, I'm sorry, I'm deaf, hearing people's response is, oh, I don't believe you. And I'm quite surprised at that. I'm taken aback. And I say, yes, I am deaf. And they say, oh, I'm sorry. And they start to explain. And then also when I explain that I'm a producer, I cre create music, they're quite surprised again. And they say, well, how do you create music if you're deaf? And I'm having to repeat and explain how I'm able to do this through vibration, through uh, strong music in the environment, using very loud speakers. And I've had to do this several times. I think education is very important. However, I think this is the problem and we need to change the system, the culture, um, and so that they can understand that people who have disabilities aren't impeded by their disability and they're able to have hot skills, as I would call it. And that's really what I need to say. Yeah, agreed completely. There's a certain presumption of incompetence that we all face I think I think everyone here will have experienced that at some point this idea that we can't simply be great artists we have to be 
you know we're, we're maybe all right artists but you can't be a great artist you can't actually excel in an area because if you do you're not disabled and you're clearly disabled so you can't excel and it just becomes this cycle and one of the things that I've loved about the series of articles on art activism and access that the welcome did and about this talk has been that it's brought together people who really are just great at what they do um and I've really enjoyed that um and we have about 15 or 20 questions that we just haven't had time to get to and I'm sorry we could easily go for another hour but unfortunately we are we are out of time um so I just wanted to say you know thank you so much for joining us today um I've had a really lovely hour with these artists and I hope that you have as well um thank you all for your brilliant questions um for your time for your engagement um do kind of stay connected with the welcome collection and our upcoming and future programs um there will be more to experience over the current current coming months um the website is at welcomecollection.org and there is a kind of email flyer email list um if you go back to the event pages for this event you will find all sorts of social media handles from all of the people involved so check them out follow them see what they're doing next it will be great you won't regret it um a huge thanks to Isegboa and Michelle for doing the BSL interpreting and for Jen for doing the captions, um, for Emily at the welcome for helping me put this together, Sol for moderating the questions, um, Lewis, Justin and Thea for doing the tech, um, which I can assure you was monstrous and is an example of how trying to really build access into something is not easy, it takes a lot of time, effort and commitment. So a huge thanks to the welcome for being the collection, for being the kind of place that makes that commitment and to all of you, thank you so much for coming and have a wonderful evening.